All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Of course, the phone is ringing right now. We have to keep the tech issues going today. Uh, <laughs> so we are joined for the very first time by Dr. Joe Fowler. He is a sea turtle researcher, sea turtle biologist, and the research director of the Coretta Research Project. Today, he is in beautiful Georgia, and he is going to showcase a little bit about his amazing work with turtles, uh, why they're so important, and what you can do at home to protect them. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fowler, and take us away. Thank you, Jesse, and thanks, everybody, for, for joining me today. Um, I'm excited to tell you about my project. Uh, I'm Dr. Joe Fowler. Like Jesse said, I'm the research director of a nonprofit loggerhead uh, bio, uh, research and conservation project on the coast of Georgia. We've got the lovely live oaks and Spanish moss in, in Georgia. I'm on the island right now. We actually patrolled the beach for the turtles last night and we're busy all night long. Didn't have any breaks the entire night. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing out here and why we're doing it. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, uh, loggerhead turtles and all sea turtles spend about 95% of their time in the water. So for us humans on land, it's actually really hard to access them, to study them, to learn about the biology and also to conserve them. And one part of the turtle's life cycle puts them on the beach. And that's when the adult turtles crawl up on the beach, mostly in temperate and tropical beaches around the world and lay their eggs. So that gives us an opportunity to go out on the beach, find them, study them and monitor their populations. And so that's what my project has been doing on the Wausau National Wildlife Refuge here in Georgia since 1973. So we have one of the longest running uh, sea turtle research projects in the world. And basically, our two main pieces of research equipment are one, this Kawasaki mule right here, um, that helps us patrol the beach. Our, our, our goals, one of our main goals is to go out on the beach and count every single nest that's laid on that beach. That allows us to track how many nests are laid throughout the years. The other thing this, this vehicle allows us to do is intercept the females. So the females crawl up out of the ocean, they're 300 pounds, and they lug their body up the beach and they leave a nice deep crawl in the sand. So when we're driving down the beach, we're looking for that deep crawl. We're not usually looking for the female. She's usually up in the dunes laying her eggs, but we look for that crawl. And when we find them, we go up there to see what they're doing. And if they're at a point in their nesting process where we can uh, collect data from them, then that's what we'll do. And the next main piece of information that allows us to study the turtles are tags. So each turtle gets a little tag. I just pulled me backwards for you guys. They get metal tags in their flippers. And just like your cat or dog, they get a tag underneath their skin, which we can then read with this scanner. And so by identifying each individual turtle to basically giving her a name, um, we can track that individual over time. And so when we first started, in back in the 70s, of course, I didn't start in the 70s, I'm not that old, but um, when we first started, we didn't know anything about turtles. We knew that the females nested on the beaches. A lot of people knew that the flesh and eggs tasted pretty good, but we didn't know anything about their biology. So with these tags, back in the 70s, we learned that turtles don't just nest one time. Within one season, they'll lay up to eight clutches of eggs, and those clutches are between maybe 80 and like 180 eggs in one clutch. And they'll lay up to eight of those every year. Then what we learn from these tags is that they don't lay eggs every year. So they come up one year, lay a whole bunch of eggs, and then they've got to go home to their foraging area and eat a whole bunch of food and gain a whole bunch of fat. So that about three or four years later, they come back and lay their eggs again. So these mysteries of their biology were unknown prior to these little metal tags. And so we have a massive data set right now, 40, I guess it's coming on 48 years um, of uh, data on these loggerheads. And what we found is that their populations are going up. What you see in the news is that, oh, you know, there's a lot of threats for sea turtles, and that is definitely true, but the conservation actions that this project and a lot of people around the world have been doing for the last 40 or 50 years has made a real difference in the population. So back in the 70s and 80s, 
we had about on this island, we had about 60 nests per year. Last year, we had 400 nests. So our workload has increased. Um, the turtles are coming in force. Uh, we are loving it. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's, it's a great time to be on the beach with turtles everywhere. Like I said, last night, we were out all night. We had 14 crawls on the beach and we had five different nests by five different females. Um, we got, we collected all their data, all their body size data. We collect genetic samples. And of course we get our very important tagging data. Um, so that's sort of what we do on this project in terms of the research. Once those eggs are laid, we also will protect them because generating that next generation of sea turtles is really important too. And that was something we started back in the seventies. That's probably why we see so many more turtles. Now we have a lot of predators on the beach that love to eat turtle eggs. And we start by putting screens over the, over the nest to keep the predators out, which allows us to generate a lot more hatchlings. So we do research, we do protection. And the other really exciting thing that we do is we involve public volunteers in our research. So people from anybody from the public, as long as you're at least 15 years old, you can come out to the island. You actually pay to help us do the work, but all that, that money goes to supporting the project. You get to come patrol the beach with us. You get to ride the mules, not drive them, but you get to ride the mules and uh, patrol the beach with us, intercept the females, help us collect the scientific data that we use to uh, monitor the population. So research protection and that education component is really what we're all about. And so you guys should look us up, coretaresearchproject.org. If you're of age and of interest, uh, it's a really amazing time, um, a full week of some of my cooking, um, but also research on the beach and uh, you know, unique time with a sea turtle biologist all week long, staying in some beautiful uh, forested hammock right here. Actually, the cabin's just right around the corner. And uh, do we lose it? Do we lose somebody? No, we're all good. We're all here, man. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, check us out. Um, come join us. That is actually how I started here. Back in 1998, when I was just turned 15 years old, I came out here with my family and started volunteering, got hooked. Um, Volunteered for a bunch more years, did my graduate work, got my PhD in sea turtle biology and became the research director. So uh, you never know what, what a trip out here can, can do for you. Awesome. I'll field any questions at this point. Outstanding, Dr. Fowler. Well, that was awesome. I, my first question is, what do you cook? We, you said you have to endure your cooking and what, what's on the menu? <laughs> well, of course, Tuesdays is always tacos. You have to have taco Tuesday. Oh. Throw that off and then, <laughs> then everything's out the window. But all, all, all your good home cooking, spaghetti, tacos uh, we have a breakfast night which everybody seems to love you know we have we have pretty primitive conditions out here but, but i think a lot of people are thinking oh i'm gonna eat rice and beans for a week well no we actually eat pretty well fantastic well i shared the coretta research project information in the youtube chat bar so everyone can check that out see how they can get involved and we'd really appreciate highlighting such a neat ecotourism model this is something that we cover a lot here at exploring by the seat of your pants uh, but a lot more local than some of our other ones we've shared so i really appreciate this all right uh on that note we've got a couple live groups so i'm going to come to them for some questions in a minute we've got tons of people tuning in on youtube so just let me know where you're joining from i'll share as many questions as i can but I want to go first to Mila in Mesa, Arizona, joining us, a huge turtle fan. So Mila, if you want to kick us off with a question, uh, just unmute your microphone. It's not letting me do that today, and uh, then you'll be good to go. Um, so actually, I was wondering, like, when you were talking about, like, how the, um, how when you, like, put the metal tags on the turtles, I was, like, it's, like, all, like, to me, it kind of reminds me of how it does on, like, that owls because some people when they go out and like find owls some like to like learn about them they put um metal um like rings or bracelets i don't know i like to think of them as that instead of rings going on their foot yeah. um i kind of then um like it's kind of like that basically right yeah yeah that's exactly right and actually wildlife biologists around the world use tags or bands um, any kind of external marking that allows you to individually identify a turtle or a, a bird or a bear or a crab, whatever you want. Uh, there are any sort of, um, we call them tags. We actually use the metal tags. Birds use bands. Um, they use all sorts of other techniques on 
any number of animals, as long as you can understand how frequently those tags are lost, because sometimes they fall out, then you can understand, you can better identify the, the you know, important parameters that you're trying to study with the, with the populations. Nice. I'm so glad we got up tags. Literally, the last presentation we did was on monarch butterflies. So no matter what kind of species you're doing, there are ways of tracking and understanding them in the world. So yeah. really cool question, Mila. Great for kicking us off. Um, Miss Martin's class joining us. If you guys have a question, uh, I know you're tuning in on, on Google uh, Meets as well. So Miss Martin, you're unmuted. If you have a question on behalf of your class, go for it. We haven't forwarded any questions yet, but uh, if you stop and check in with us again, uh, we might have something for you later. I sure will. All right. Well, in the meantime, one of our questions is from Susan on YouTube. She wants to know, have you ever seen any leatherbacks there? And you can extend this to generally other species of sea turtle around the area where you guys work. Sure. So in Georgia, we get about 99.9% .9 loggerheads. Um, and they're my favorite, but I'll talk to the other species, of course. <laughs> leatherbacks are amazing. They're huge. Seven feet long, 700 pounds. We have actually had loggerheads here before. Um, we've had about, I'd say, five or six crawls in the last 20 years or so. Two of them, actually three of them, are from the same female. So some of our nests, are we have a female that seems to come back every few years. The main leatherback nesting populations in our area are down in Florida. And then Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina get some like random smattering of leatherback nests uh, throughout the year. Um, we also occasionally get Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. That's the little small ones that, I mean, small like tire size turtles not like a leatherback but they're they're the ones who nest almost exclusively in mexico but sometimes we'll get nests in florida eastern florida and georgia and then the next most common after loggerheads are the green turtles these are the ones you see on seagrass beds they're the ones you see they're the iconic species on all sorts of sea turtle art um and we get about i don't know 20 or 30 nests green turtle nests in in georgia every every few years Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. Uh, you know, this diversity of sea turtles leads me to my next question from Miss Lee's class joining us in Vancouver, BC. They wanted to know which one's the most endangered. A lot of our classes come in, they're really interested in conservation. So are, are there any turtles that are particularly in jeopardy? Yeah, so all species of sea turtle are either threatened or endangered. Um, the Kemp's Ridley that I just mentioned is particularly vulnerable because it's only found essentially in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic seaboard. So it's got a much smaller distribution in the other species. So it, basically all the other species are globally distributed except for the flatback sea turtle, which is only found in Australia. But everything else is, is you know, kind of spread across the world. But in sea turtle conservation, we actually think more about populations versus species because they're, they're so widely distributed and they're actually genetically distinct in different parts of the world. They're still the same species, but they're different populations. Um, we think about um, the populations that are stable or declining or increasing. And so a lot of sea turtle populations are doing fairly well, but the Pacific leatherback and the Pacific hawksbill are doing particularly poorly. Um, and then a couple of the loggerhead populations in the Indian Ocean and in the Eastern North Atlantic are, are not doing quite as well. And we're trying to figure out why that is and use uh, conservation and advocacy and policy to correct those, those declining populations. Nice. Thank you so much, Joe. All right. Uh, Ms. Gualtieri's class joining us. They want to know how long are, are turtles pregnant for and how many eggs do they lay at one time? Mm -hmm. So the way sea turtle reproductive biology works is that, like I told you before, they take a few years off. They go to wherever their foraging area is, usually not next to the nesty beach. Usually it's quite far away. They eat as much as they can. They build up a lot of fat. Our turtles right now actually have fat kind of coming out of their shoulders and their hips. Uh, they're looking really, really good. And then they'll meet the males about three weeks before the nesting season starts. And they'll mate with multiple males. The males will mate with multiple females. And then the males go off back to their foraging areas and the females go to the nesting beaches. So the females have all the sperm they need for the entire season and for uh, fertilizing every single one of those eggs they laid throughout the season. So they're really only pregnant, we call it gravid uh, in, in uh, reptile research, every two weeks throughout the year. So they have clutches of 100 to 120 eggs that come through like a factory. So they drop one clutch off and they've got two weeks to yoke up another one and put shells on them. They come up two weeks later, drop those ones off, and then do the whole process a couple more times throughout the year. So they're kind of gravid or pregnant 
multiple times through each summer that they come to breed. And they come to breed every three or four years. So they, they need that time after the season's over to go fill those fat stores again before they can breed again. Awesome, what a great answer. All right, let's go to Ms. Martin's class. I know Nate in your class has a question. So Ms. Martin, uh, you're unmuted, go for it. Um, I just have to go back to that. Give me one second. It was in our chat, wasn't it? Yep. Nate wants to know, are the turtles threatened by plastics and garbage in your area? Um, thankfully, in the Northwest Atlantic where I am, we don't see a whole lot of that. Um, there are other places in the world um, where it's a big problem, the middle of Pacific, the South Atlantic, but for whatever reason in the Northwest Atlantic, while we see a lot of plastic garbage washing on the beaches, we don't tend to find it in the guts of the turtles that we find washing up. Um, so it, at least at this point, plastic has not become a major threat to the turtles in this area. Um, more so uh, up in the Northeast, there's a lot of pollution coming out of the rivers. So we see a lot of uh, biological contaminants in the turtles up there and also the eggs that they lay. But the two main things in the North Atlantic are fisheries bycatch and boat strikes. So, you know, those big fishing vessels that are out in the middle of the ocean, they have a whole bunch of hooks on strings or they're dragging big nets. That's what catches a lot of turtles. And then especially in Florida where there's a lot of recreational boat traffic, that's where we see a lot of turtles that get hit by boats. So plastic's a threat, but it's not quite as big as some of these other, other issues. Awesome. This is a great segue into a, a program that we, we cover a lot here on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So we work with the Turtle Hospital in Marathon, Florida. They talk about boat strikes a lot. And so they're a facility where people can bring injured sea turtles. Is there anything like that in Georgia or up the eastern seaboard? Or is that sort of a, a unique enterprise? Yeah, well, the, the, the um, hospital in Marathon Key was one of the first in the world. Um, so they're sort of pioneers in this front. But the state of Georgia has one called the Jekyll Island Sea Turtle Center. And it, it's the Georgia Sea Turtle Center on Jekyll Island, excuse me. And it's fantastic. If you get a chance to, go, if you're driving by, going up the coast on I-95, swing by and see it. They've got turtles most of the time because we do have issues with debilitated turtles washing up and boat strikes and things like that. They've got a wonderful educational facility. And they even have an active veterinary um, office right there. So there's a big window where you can watch the vets doing procedures on turtles. So the Georgia's Sea Turtle Center on Jekyll Island is absolutely worth seeing. How cool is that? Thanks, Joe. All right, uh, a question about uh, something that we covered in the test the other day. I don't know if you happen to have these with you and I don't wanna build people up. Do you happen to have some of those turtle materials you had the other day, maybe the shell or the, the skull with you? Yeah, yeah, actually I was gonna pull this thing up. Here's what uh, an adult loggerhead wow. shell looks like. So this is a particularly big one. This, this animal washed up dead, unfortunately, a few years ago. But they're, you know, a good three, four feet long. Um, if you get in their way, they won't hesitate to move you out of the way. Um, they're trying to get back to the water. Here's the a, a skull of one. This is actually not that big of one, it, but they, they're called loggerheads for a reason. They've got a big head, they've got huge jaws, and their, their skull, if you look at the back, you'd think, oh, it must have a big brain, right? No, the brain goes right there. This is all muscle right here okay so they're not thinking animals they're crushing animals okay so they eat a lot of benthic invertebrates um and they eat, so they eat snails and clams and they smash those things to bit bits and swallow them with that big head of theirs yeah so that's what those muscles for are just for creating a really really powerful bite down to crush through those things yep yep and the turtles on on in this area love to eat horseshoe crabs so big hard uh, invertebrate that needs a lot of bite force to smash through that outside exoskeleton so that their digestive juices can then work in there and, and get all the goodies out. Super cool. I don't think we've ever done a program with horseshoe crabs on this uh, on this show, oh, but uh, for anyone at home that might not know what they look like, check out horseshoe crabs and they're done. They're one of the oldest groups of animals in the whole world. They're really, really cool. All right. Uh, Jack wants to know on YouTube, uh, how many turtle eggs usually survive to adulthood? So this is a story that we often cover with turtle presentations. And I'm sure you can highlight that for us, Joe. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of different metrics, right? There's eggs to adulthood and there's hatchlings to adulthood. So we, we have better guesses on the hatchling part because we know roughly how many eggs produce hatchlings. So on, the, on my beach, we have about 
65% hatching success. So that is the 65% of the eggs that are laid generate hatchlings. And then from that point on, our best guesses, and these are guesses, um, are between one in a thousand and one in 5,000 hatchlings reaching adulthood. Based on the number of hatchlings that go into the water, if it was any higher than that, if it was any better than that, we'd have turtles coming out our ears, okay? The, what you have to remember is that this is the way the turtle life cycle is designed, okay? The individual females, although they're nice, they're good mothers, they dig a hole and they give each little hatching a little bit of yolk, they, that's about all they do. So when uh, an adult invests that little in each individual uh, offspring, generally not very many of them survive. If you think about yourself and how much time and effort and money and blood, sweat and tears that your parents spent keeping you alive, there's no wonder that humans have such a high uh, survival rate. So that's, that's the way animals work. You know, loggerheads put out a lot of eggs and only some of them survive. If you think about a lot of invertebrates like crabs, they're putting out tens of thousands of young that go out into the plankton and a tiny percentage of them come back to their adult habitats to, to survive. So that's just kind of the way, that's the trade-offs in, in animal life history. I love that we got in a parenting lesson in there on how much work it takes to raise all you guys. So way to go. Um, my favorite analogy in this is elephants, like the slowest breeding animal. I think if every elephant baby survived, it's like 20,000 years and we're all like a mile deep in elephants over the surface of the world. So yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to go back to Mila in Arizona. If you have another question for us, uh, come on up. You just need to demute your mic. You're set. Um, so I was wondering, like, how do you get like, like, the like how do you guys like test the turtles like how do you do it test the turtles what do you mean like how do you like get like dna from ah. them mm -hmm. and stuff like that okay yeah we have two methods for um dna analysis so i told you about the our tags right and it turns out that just like you and i turtles have individualized genetic tags so we can actually go out and take a skin sample from a turtle even if she doesn't have tags and know who she is. Another really cool thing that we've been a part of with the University of Georgia is that a freshly laid eggshell actually has the mom's DNA in it, you know, cause the mom made that egg. So when she puts it in the ground, her DNA is in that shell. So even if we don't see the female, we can grab an egg out and send the, the eggshell sample to the University of Georgia and they can look up it's that turtle's genetic tag, which is when then we can relate to the, the the metal tags that we put in the flippers. So it's a really neat way of uh, sampling the population without actually having to intercept the females. Now, I personally like to see the, the adult turtles, so I'd rather go out and see the turtle and collect a sample from her than to do the eggshell without her. But that's that's the two ways we can genetically identify the, the turtles. Very cool, Joe. So in your time doing this, how many turtles have you had the chance to interact with and take samples from? Uh, well, this project since 73 has tagged about, I think it's right around 2,800 individual loggerheads. Wow. Um, as far as I'm, I go, I don't know. Uh, you know, these turtles nest every few years. So I've seen multiple turtles through multiple seasons. So I can see that the turtles that I saw last night I can look up in our database and say, oh, sheesh, I saw her in 2010. I saw her in 2015 and 2017, you know? And so how many of those individuals I've seen, I don't know, but it's probably close to a thousand and several of those multiple times. Yeah, very cool. I really do like to picture you around a computer going, oh, sheesh, every time that happens. So thank you oh, for that. Um, let's go back to Ms. Martin's class. We're gonna take a few more questions. Um, Ms. Martin's group, come on up. If you have another, just demute your mic and go for it. Let's... Owen would like to know how long it takes for turtle eggs to hatch. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, our range is between about 40 days and 70 days, and the difference is based on temperature. So if it's colder, the t eggs take a little bit longer to hatch, and if it's hotter, they take a short amount of time to hatch. So the eggs that are being laid right now will probably take around 65 days, whereas the ones that are laid in July will probably take about 40 days. Nice. Uh, a great follow-up question on that from Vivian on YouTube. She wants to know how long does it take from a bait to get from a baby turtle to an adult turtle? Mm -hmm. Well, again, these are questions that are really hard to assess. Uh, sea turtle biologists for years have been trying to figure this out. Our best 
best guesses on that are about 30 years for loggerheads. Loggerheads and green turtles, for whatever reason, usually take, you know, three decades to reach sexual maturity. Amazingly, those huge leatherbacks are about half that, about 15 years. So if you think about the way humans are, we can reproduce relatively quickly compared to turtles. So turtles, turtles longevity is, is their, their generation time is so slow because it takes them 30 years for each sexual maturity. And so if, if you're a sea turtle conservation biologist, you have to be very patient, <laughs> right? So those nests that we protected back in the 70s and 80s, we had to sit there and keep keep doing our work, keep protecting nests, keep trying to fund projects like this for 30 years before we said, oh my gosh, now we're probably starting to see those females that were hatchlings back in the 80s. Right. So that that 30 year period is really important for how you conserve long lived animals like sea turtles. Yeah. I love that we bring up that message and this is something that we highlight in conservation stories so much, how important it is to keep these projects going for a long time. Conservation is not a, you know, one solution fix uh, and it takes many years and a lot of dedicated people like you to make it happen. So we really appreciate you personally and uh, really nice to hear that some good success stories going on. Absolutely. All right, uh, Chelsea on YouTube wants to know about what hatchlings eat. So that the adults have these huge muscles, they can crush these big things. The babies are presumably way smaller, tinier muscles, what do they eat? Yeah. So when a hatchling turtle comes out of their egg, they actually have a little ball of yolk still in their tummy. So for the first about two weeks of their lives, they don't eat and they just swim, 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 swim as fast as they can offshore to get away from all the nearshore predators. So in that time, they're consuming that yolk that they've got inside them. Then once they get out to the offshore currents and for our turtles, the Sargasso Sea, um, they will eat anything that will fit in their mouths. They're pretty carnivorous at that point. So whether it's crabs or um, jellyfish or anything that's floating around out there, they will eat. They're, they're really little trash cans. And the unfortunate part about that gets back to our previous question is that anything that will fit in their mouth, they'll eat. So if there's little bits of plastic floating out there, they will eat those things. And this has become a big problem because the little turtles are much less discerning with what they're eating than the adult ones. The adult ones can seem to be able to say, hmm, that doesn't seem like food. I'm not going to eat it. Or yes, I'm going to eat it. The hatchlings and the young ones just gobble, gobble, gobble. They're just eating everything that, that they can find. We're going to come back to plastics in a minute before we wrap up the broadcast. And I'm really glad you brought that up. But I do like turtles, little trash cans. That might be our byline for the next time we do this program. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to go to Ms. Martin for a question, and then Amila is going to show us something that she created, especially for the Zoom meeting, which is really cool. And we'll wrap up with a few general ones. So Ms. Martin, if you have another question, uh, go for it. Just unmute your mic and uh, yeah, take us away. Awesome. Thank you. I have got two questions. Brandon would like to know how long turtles live, and Landon would like to know what's under the turtle shell. Nice. Okay. Okay, so how long turtles live? Well, we talked about how long it takes them to reach maturity, about 30 years. Um, our best guesses for how long they live after that come from the nesting projects like this one. The, um, the longest nesting histories in my project's database are right around 32, 34 years. So that would put their maximum age somewhere around 65. Um, that's probably a lot younger than most people think you know, Finding Nemo kind of led us astray by saying 150 years and still young or whatever that was. That's yeah. not true. Um, if, they, if they start breeding at 30 and they live to be 150 and they lay eggs every three years, that's thousands and thousands and thousands of eggs by in each individual, which is just not what happens. So right around 67 is the, is the so those are like the one percenters, it seems like. Those are the ones that just happen to be able to survive and reproduce for that long. We don't know a whole lot about senescence. That's the period of life after you breed um, because we don't see the turtles on the beach anymore. So it's kind of hard to, to follow them. So that's, that's our best guesses on age. Um, what's under a turtle shell? Well, a turtle shell is actually its spinal column. So like if you feel right down the middle of your back, this is the turtle's spinal column and these are its ribs. Okay, so the turtles, what's under the turtle's shell is all of its organs, right? So the shell is this bony structure. You know, just imagine your rib cage expanding out, creating a shell and fusing with your vertebral column, your spinal column right down the middle. That creates the turtle's shell. 
and right underneath the shell is the lungs. And then just like us, heart, liver, kidneys, intestines, all that fun stuff. If you open up a turtle and you don't open up a human, they really don't look all that different. They're both vertebrates. They both have a very similar setup. So what's under a turtle shell is their, is their organs. Yeah. Outstanding. I'm so glad we get that message. In. And also, I find it funny, every time we do a session on sea turtles, it universally gets brought up that Finding Nemo is wrong. It's one of my funniest things when we do yeah. these programs. So. They, had a lot of, they had a lot of things right, but that was not right. Yeah. Fantastic movie. Don't take it for science, necessarily. Right. All right. Uh, Mila, I want to give you the chance to showcase what you created for the presentation. That's awesome. And then we'll wrap up with a couple questions after that. So Mila, uh, show us what you got. Okay. So... A while ago, I figured that since we're going to do this on the turtles, uh, I made this a while ago, but I made like a turtle conservation with the Lego set. Nice. nice. How and cool it has, is that? And it has like, like a little baby turtle right here. <laughs> awesome. And then, You're like, like cooking with grass. All set. And I have this right here, which is like a little thing like to go out in the ocean and all that. We like that you and rock. this is like like a little underwater piece and it almost has like a robot taking care of a baby turtle under the ocean i think that's a good idea joe for future uh turtle robots are the the future of, of conservation mila that was awesome so you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna segue this into a question so mila and i'm sure there's some other kids out there that they want to be you when they grow up joe so what what can kids do to like end up in the position that you're in sure um, well obviously Keep, keep doing well in school as best you can. Keep getting outside and, um, you know, nurturing your love for being outside because, you know, even here in May, I'm sweating, I'm getting eaten by bugs, but I love it out here. So don't, don't forget about all the wonderful and kind of horrific things you can see outside and learn to enjoy them. Um, like I said, keep up with school. Don't, don't slack on math and statistics. They are really important in science. Um, yeah, and get, get out there and volunteer when you can. And then eventually that experience that you gain as a volunteer will help you get positions along the way that you can be an interns or you could be technical assistants, research assistants. That'll give you all the, the it'll load your toolbox of, of tools with all sorts of things that you can use in your career that eventually you can get a job kind of like mine and you can, Spend most of your time at the computer and then a lot of time also in the field <laughs> going out looking for turtles and spending time in beautiful places like this. Outstanding. Well, we'll, we'll wrap up with just one more, uh, which is just uh, how can, what can kids do at home to help turtles? So we've highlighted a few threats that are facing turtles. Uh, you've showcased all your amazing work. If I finish this broadcast and I want to help save the sea turtles off Georgia or around the world, what can I do? Yeah. Okay. So we talked about plastics. So, and I think most of you probably know this. Single use plastics are a major problem. Anything that takes that much to produce, we use once and throw away should be off the plate for what we would want to use in our lives. Cause those things ultimately get into the ocean and cause a lot of problems, not just for turtles, but for a lot of wildlife. If you own a boat or you want to own a boat, uh, one thing we say is go slow for those below. Turtles aren't fast. Um, they get hit by boats frequently, manatees the same way. If you're in areas where you know there are turtles or manatees or dolphins, just take your time. You know, I'm not saying don't boat, but be careful, be cognizant that there are, an are animals under the water you might not be able to see. Um, I talked about bycatch. Um, make sure you're using sustainable fisheries or maybe not fisheries at all. You know, some of these, some of these organizations catch a lot of things they don't want to catch. So turtles, seabirds, sea lions, dolphins, a lot of sharks are caught that they don't want to catch. So anything you, we can do to reduce the number of boats out there uh, catching these, these uh, prized fish can help the turtles and everything else. Um, if you live near a beach, be sure to be cognizant of how, where your lights are. Lights, turtles, and uh, adult turtles and hatchlings are very sensitive to light. So... If you're on a beach, make sure you turn your lights off at night. And if you go out on the beach, make sure you don't use any lights at all. Your eyes usually adjust the moonlight pretty quickly. So you should be able to see the turtles you want to see without any lights. So those are sort of just main threats that, that affect sea turtles that you can sort of help out with in your day-to-day -day lives. 
Amazing. Well, certainly, uh, I hope a lot of our people viewing today get a chance to do all those activities when they leave this broadcast. Do check out Coretta Research Project online. Some really great resources there. Lots more to learn. Um, and Dr. Fowler, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate it. Thanks for setting up, Jesse. Awesome. My pleasure and hope to be back soon, uh, whether it's live on the beach, highlighting some cool pictures of the work you guys get to do, or in this awesome grant uh, stand of trees, which is probably the best backdrop we've ever had for an exploring my secret band. So really appreciate that. And uh, I'll turn it over to, to Mila and Miss Martin. If you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you to Dr. Fowler for joining us today. Uh, you guys should be demuted. Um, go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fowler. We really appreciate you sharing your uh, research and expertise with us. Thank you, guys. And Mila, thanks for showing that awesome stuff you created, too. Hopefully, we've inspired a few other kids to do some cool art projects, highlight their passions, and get excited. Um, and robot turtle carers, we're going to do a program on that probably in like 20 years. Uh, I'm really excited. Joe, if you're involved in that, let me know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll see you all soon, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye for now.